Welcome to part four. In this video series, I have so far indicted most schools in the world today of harming children. And I left off the last episode, noting that if your identity is tied to one of those schools, you might take my criticism personally. But please rest assured, the problem is not you. It is the system and how it has been organized over many generations to shape the situation of schooling in ways of which you are not even aware. Because it is a large scale system, even if you are the most sophisticated, knowledgeable, and wonderful teacher in the entire world, the system is still bigger and over time has way more power to subvert your best efforts. So in the end, against isolated individual efforts, the system always wins, no matter how brilliant the individual. The K-12 classroom school system is a very large, very well-meant and logical extension of what was known to be true when it was developed. We now know things to be different, and some honest mistakes were made, so correction is in order. But we need to correct them with organized and coordinated actions that will ultimately shift the policies that guide the system. That system was designed logically following perfectly well-intentioned beliefs about people and learning that turned out to be wrong. Let me give you a parallel historical example to illustrate what I mean. Imagine you are a hospital surgeon in the year 1840, and you, along with the majority of your colleagues, believe in the miasma theory of disease. In other words, you believe that bad smells cause disease. And you also believe that bleeding, cupping, and purging your patients can enable any bad miasmatic humors to be released from their bodies. Based on your belief, you will insist that patients get fresh air as much as possible even if that means opening windows in the middle of a frigid winter. You would not bother to wear any kind of gloves during surgery, and between surgeries, rather than wash your hands, you would be more likely to dab perfume on them to make them smell nice. Even if you are one of the best doctors in the world at one of the best hospitals, at least 40 and as many as 80 of every 100 of your patients get infections, and many of those people die. Now, imagine that you miraculously time traveled to today. You would learn from your modern colleagues how the current medical establishment operates under germ theory and how less than seven in every 100 of their patients get infections. And even those who get infections almost always survive. This leads you to con logically conclude with great sadness undoubtedly that your belief in the miasma theory was a major cause of death for your patients. But now here's the critical question. How responsible is a surgeon from 1840 for the consequences of the systematic ignorance of the entire medical field for things which had not even been invented yet? Of course you will feel bad and regret the consequences of your ignorance, but you and the entire medical establishment to which you belong were mistaken. You did not and could not possibly have known any better. Throughout almost all of the 1800s, surgeons were operating within a system of medicine that failed to understand the true causes of disease. As a result, their patients died left and right all over the place at rates that we would find completely unacceptable today. But their behavior was completely understandable and the results excusable given what they knew at the time, even though their knowledge was incorrect. Of course, now that you know better, your responsibility as a surgeon has changed for your future patients. But you should not berate yourself for your previous performance. By the same logic, if you are a school teacher or a principal today, you are not to blame for failing to nurture your students or teachers in the past. It is important to realize that your behavior has been perfectly consistent with a powerful, large-scale system of schooling, which happens to be misguided by incorrect assumptions about people and learning. School teachers and principals today are operating within a system that is designed as if education is merely the delivery of knowledge, skills, and information, in which nurturing the children is somebody else's responsibility. Now we know that education is better understood as a mental mapping process in which everyone in school arrives with flawed maps. The primary task is to figure out how to work together to improve those mental maps 
so everyone can create effective strategies for navigating their lives successfully. I will talk more about these metaphors elsewhere. And we also now know that nurturing children must be the responsibility of every adult who interacts with the children, not just their parents. By nurturing, I mean simply providing support for the kids to satisfy their primary human needs, which includes the needs for autonomy, competence, and relatedness. Those three needs are currently treated as if they are equivalent to entertainment. If a school fails to provide entertainment, then they would likely be congratulated for keeping distractions from schoolwork to a minimum. The pseudo need for entertainment can be adequately filled in other contexts beside school. In the same way, responsibility for those needs are assumed to be in somebody else's hands, so schools don't worry too much about them. But there are over 30 years of research data showing that children are harmed by this neglect of those psychological needs. Those needs are more like air than entertainment. A school failing to provide enough air for students is inexcusable because of the harm they would cause the children that they're supposed to be caring for. Failing to support primary psychological needs needs to become as unthinkable as failing to provide enough air. The field of education psychology needs to focus on redesigning the hidden curriculum. The fact that children's primary psychological needs are chronically unmet in most schools currently means that in spite of everyone in schools being completely unaware of learning it and completely unaware of having participated in teaching it, there is a pervasive hidden curriculum that teaches everyone in the school system that autonomy, competence, and relatedness are not important. We currently have too many schools in which controlling instructional behaviors are a consistent pattern. Controlling instructional behaviors are the literal need thwarting opposite of instructional behaviors that are supportive of the primary psychological need for autonomy. Those schools are routinely demanding that children learn an imposed curriculum. When the imposition becomes an issue, then the demand becomes the equivalent of asking children to do the impossible task of not looking at my nose while continuing to see all the rest of my face. The children are being asked to make behavioral choices that are not, in fact, choices at all. And complying with those demands is psychologically harmful because complying thwarts at least one of the children's primary human needs. In fact, all the humans in school are subjected to this kind of damage via the hidden curriculum when it thwarts their primary human needs. Education psychology should be exploring what it takes to transform the hidden curriculum to support, instead of thwart, the primary human needs of both children and teachers. Current education policies implemented by districts at the command of state and federal legislatures via their departments of education are creating situations that encourage schools to exert instructional control over children and their teachers by imposing demands even though that causes the neglect of primary psychological needs. This is wrong. All adults responsible for children must ensure they have been nurtured before providing academic enrichment. Now, academic enrichment is a wonderful thing, and it is a perfectly reasonable requirement of soldiers, voters, drivers, leaders, and workers to have at least basic academic skills. School children are not yet old enough to assume those roles, but they are old enough to participate with their family in making meaningful decisions about what kinds of courses and activities are worth pursuing in a community college-like setting, as demonstrated for over 10 years at the Village Home Education Resource Center. They are old enough to participate in helping other members of their school community hold each other accountable in a democratic school, as Sudbury Valley School has been doing for over 47 years, and the Village Preschool has been doing for over a decade. How we engage children in assuming meaningful roles in their current life will be an important part of how well they are prepared to assume meaningful roles in later life. If I am going to act responsibly as a principal or teacher, then I have to deliberately shape the situation in which lessons occur. 
The situation I create needs to respect the inherent constraints on how attention is paid by students and teachers. Human nature, as minimally specified by primary human needs, is such that we are driven to be simultaneously competent, autonomous, and related meaningfully to others. These are the constraints upon how attention is paid by students and all the other humans in schools. Offering a responsible schooling situation requires us to act within these constraints. The challenge we face is to recreate the situation of mainstream schooling through policies at every level of the school system. We need to remove barriers to students meeting their primary psychological needs, and we need to reinforce nurturing behaviors throughout school communities so that they become pervasive facts of school life. Here at Schools of Conscience, we are developing tools to teach teachers and principals the basic skills they need to provide support for primary need satisfaction. And we are also organizing to ensure that nurturing becomes protected behavior. One of our key strategies is to develop a new form of accreditation model that can be applied to any school, including democratic schools. Democratic schools are so radically different from mainstream schools that they are not effectively accommodated by traditional school accreditation systems. If this is of interest to you, I encourage you to explore my site, schoolsofconscience.org. My site has lots of information and provides affordable access to a variety of tools that you might find useful for building your capacity for nurturing. I also hope the site will build connections among those of us who recognize this important challenge. Thanks for watching.